Hello to those of uh, those joining us by way of our, Pres our Amity Presbyterian Church uh, Facebook page and uh, our YouTube channel. We, uh, we welcome you, and if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to be reading from the book of Revelation. Before I read that scripture this morning, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have brought your people together this day. May these words from Scripture help us to better know you and what you would have us do as your people in Christ. Amen. So today's reading is from the book of Revelation. It's from chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Let's be attentive to these words. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb of the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. <laughs> so during the Reformation, when all the churches were being scrutinized in their practices, one of the first things that was tossed away was the celebration of All Saints Day. However, in 1932, the Presbyterian Church determined that there was this loss of unity in faith with those that have died ahead of us. In order to keep alive this sense of the communion of the saints, the church brought this day back. So this morning, we are remembering those who have kept the faith, but have moved on ahead of us to be in heaven. Here at Amity Presbyterian Church over the last year, we had one of our saints go to be with the Lord. And so today we remember June Hayden. June died on December 9th, 2019. The love for her not only sits in the hearts of her family, but also here among her church family as well. We also remember another saint, um, Diane's mom, Carol, who also recently went to be with the Lord. So before we jump into our text today, we should first talk about this book of Revelation. The book is first apocalyptic, simply meaning that we're describing or prophesying the end of times. That ought to pique your interest a little bit this morning. <clears throat> Second, it's full of imagery. So if you have a vivid imagination and like colors and sounds and extraordinary things, then this is the book for you. And lastly, the book is highly controversial. And one of the most misunderstood of all the books in the Bible. The traditional author is deemed to be John, who we know is the disciple that Jesus loved, and also one of the sons of Zebedee. 
John is also thought to be instrumental in the writing of the Gospel of John, as well as three other books in the epistles. And he's writing to the seven churches in the province of Asia, and he says that his words are prophetic, given to him from Jesus himself. You can see on our map here the seven churches. You can also see that uh, there's the island of Patmos, and that's where John is at this time. Patmos is a small Greek island there in the Aegean Sea, and uh, it was a place where the Romans exiled prisoners. John notes that he's there because he's preached the word of God, and he's suffering for the kingdom. Revelation is a fascinating book to read, so if you get some time this week, grab it and take a look through it. It's very easy to find because it's at the end, right? I'll warn you, though, that no matter how many times you read it, understanding it could be a bit of a challenge. Even lots of preachers have shied away from the book of Revelation. The imagery in this book is unlike any other in the Bible. We have golden lampstands, a woman named Jezebel. We have Satan. Anytime we have an apocalyptic reading, there's always Satan. He's always there. We have 24 thrones that are sitting next to a larger throne that has rainbows around it. We have creatures like a lion, an ox, a man and an eagle, and they're covered with eyes. There's a special scroll with seven seals. We have a slain lamb and the sounding of trumpets by angels. There's a rider on a pale horse called Death. There are earthquakes, and the moon turns the color of blood. There are locusts like horses, and we have horses breathing fire and smoke and sulfur, and these horses have tails that are snakes. The beast is associated with the number 666. There's an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns, and if that isn't enough for you, there's another beast that looks like a leopard, but has the face of a lion and the paws of a bear. And in it, there's the, the judgment of Satan and the judgment of the dead. And we also have the new heaven and the new earth. And there's much, much more in the book. Just to give you a perspective, I brought a few pictures with me of artists that have, in their minds, determined what the, uh, the end times would look like. There's our red dragon. back, there was a popular book series out um, by uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. It was called Left Behind. I don't know if many of you have, have read that or not. This is one of the books in the series, and it's about the end times. They even made a movie uh, from the book series, and critics, crit critics called it a religious science fiction thriller. So having religion science fiction in the same sentence just doesn't feel right to me. The series starts off with the rapture. And the rapture is where Christians just disappear and go up into heaven. And as you can imagine, this creates chaos throughout the world because some of those taken up are leaders of nations. Some are driving along in their cars on the highway. Some are piloting airplanes. 
as everyone tries to figure out what's happening, the book of Revelation comes into play. And that problem that churches had in attracting new members, well, it's not a problem anymore. So the Left Behind series follows the situations, situations described in our book of Revelation. So it, it's really interesting reading if any of you would like to take a look at it. Besides Revelation being a very prophetic book, it's also one of the most complex and misunderstood. Many research, many preachers and biblical scholars have tried to tackle this book over the centuries, but there are many unanswered questions. And there are different interpretations and commentaries, and they're all over the place, all over the map. We have references to the Crusades and to the Black Plague and to Adolf Hitler and World War II and the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the Internet and the United Nations and Y2K, and even references to President Trump in the current election. Basically, our book of Revelation involves a conflict between the righteous minority and the wicked majority. And after a period of intense conflict and great suffering, God intervenes and he vindicates and rewards God's people and punishes Satan and the earthly oppressors. And in the book, there are references back to the book of Daniel, many of those, and also to the book of Ezekiel and Zechariah and Psalms and Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah and even Deuteronomy. If we look at Revelation historically, it was written to warn and encourage the churches in Asia that were undergoing lots of internal problems and external persecution from the Romans. But most importantly, the overall message of the book of Revelation is that God is sovereign and he will destroy all types of evil in his own time and everyone will face a final judgment. Only faith in Jesus Christ can save us. And no matter what types of trials that we may go through, we have hope. We can have hope in eternal life. Revelation isn't a book that's, a, that's supposed to scare us. It's supposed to be a book that encourages us and give us hope for things to come. Our text that was chosen today for our scripture, it relates back to uh, saints and, of course, to All Saints Day. The saints are represented in our reading by this great multitude of people who have come from all across the earth. And they're wearing white robes and holding palm branches. And they're there to worship God. There are three very interesting things that we can conclude about these, uh, these people. First, they are saints from every nation, tribe, people, and language, making it very clear that in heaven, don't expect to see people that are like us. There are lots of different people there, and heaven isn't just composed of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. It's important to note also that the text doesn't say that everyone will be part of this multitude and in heaven. But it does say that there will be many people in it. Second, the multitude will be wearing white robes. But these robes have been at one time stained with blood. And this is interpret, interpreted as these men and women having to go through some type of extreme suffering. And this wasn't suffering like you'd have a cut and put a Band-Aid on it. 
This is something much more serious. And this period of difficulty is what they call the tribulation. And the multitude has come through it, and they're now on the other side. And third, all the pains of life are now gone. They are worshiping God without thirst and hunger and life's difficulties. These people are the victorious saints of God. Are there saints today? Are they kind of out there among us? It's a good question. Most of us may think that a saint is some extraordinary person who uh, was around a long time ago and lived almost a perfect life. Perhaps even martyred for their faith or, and then recognized by the church formally in some way. My thoughts immediately go to the 12 disciples. Right, we have St. John who wrote our scripture and St. Peter who was the first leader of the church. It's interesting, we never hear about St. Judas who was also one of the 12. I throw in St. Paul, he's one of the, he's the greatest evangelist of all of the apostles. And uh, Mary and Joseph, the earthly parents of Jesus, they're on the saints list. Most people would view those deeds as, as saints to have lived lives differently though than the rest of us. Living morally sound lives without sin and serving God that goes beyond just what is normal living. People who are Bigger than, bigger than life and do things well beyond what we are capable of. Even though these saints are long gone, their legacy, though, is still pretty apparent to the churches around us. Right here in the area, we have Catholic churches, St. Agnes and St. Stephen's, St. Elizabeth. St. Albert the Great. Presbyterians tend to stay away from naming their churches after saints. But other Protestant denominations do. We have St. Luke's Baptist Church and St. Paul's Episcopal Church that are both nearby. And even if we go beyond churches, right? It's football season now, isn't it? We have the New Orleans Saints, right? Even with their name there, they're not doing as well as our Steelers are right now. <laughs> we have cities like St. Louis and St. Petersburg. I was in Lowe's uh, store the other day and saw all the Christmas things that are out there. We have Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, right? And of course, guys, don't ever forget St. Valentine. <laughs> in our scripture, the multitudes are representative of the saints, and they are many. Not just the select few superheroes of God. In the New Testament, the use of the word saints extends also to those that have become believers and followers of Jesus. In the book of Acts, in chapter 9, it says, now, as Peter went here and there among all the believers, he came down also to the saints living in Lydda. And in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, Paul begins those books with a traditional greeting. He says, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church of God, that is in Corinth to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all those who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a beloved and endearing term that's used for new followers of Christ. And if we are believers in Christ, 
and I hope and I believe that we are, then we can consider ourselves saints as well. St. Paul and St. Peter and St. Gary. I actually like that one myself. But in order to have that title put in front of our names, it just doesn't appear there because we want it to. A person enlisting in the army just doesn't go in and tell the recruiter, hey, I'd like to sign up to be a general. So we can't call ourselves saints just because we want to. No, that title comes with a cost. And it comes with a commitment to Jesus Christ. And being a saint also takes a willingness to live by the gospel and do things that distinguish us from others. And that's to love God and to love our neighbors. Our multitudes, these saints in Revelation, they had to endure hardships. John is linking his vision to those Christians who are suffering at the hands of the Romans. And they aren't walking an easy path. They are alienated from society. They are ostracized by friend and family. There are laws prohibiting their practice of faith. They are being imprisoned and many of them are being martyred. Today we live in a world where there is still some religious persecution in countries, but it's not really a big issue for us here in the United States. We're blessed to be able to worship freely and to express our views. Sainthood is still sainthood. It just looks a little different. We live in a fallen world, and as Christians, we too have difficulties. Christians also get the coronavirus. Christians are involved in car accidents. We sometimes suffer from depression and anxiety. We are hurt by failed marriages and the loss of loved ones. We have medical issues. Being a saint doesn't immune us to pain and suffering and difficulties. Last Thursday I met some saints. I made a trip to the intersection to deliver our 74 boxes of cereal and our 219 cans of tuna. I had never been there before and it's really an interesting place. It's in a, a Greek Orthodox Hungarian church. What a wonderful group of people who were there. Totally dedicated to helping the poorest in that city. As I kept handing out boxes of cereal from my car, they kept saying, how could a small church such as yours give us all this food? They were amazed. I met a saint there named Karen, and I met Sister Bonnie and Sister Claudia, and their names are definitely on the saints list. There were several other volunteers there as well. All saints living there life by the gospel, meeting the needs of those who are hungry and those who are thirsty, those who need support and those who need love. And the work there has been going on for almost 50 years. There are quite a few great saints working out their faith on 7th Avenue near the river in McKeesport. Our scripture ends with these words of encouragement to this multitude, to these saints. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And these words are meant for us as well. 
As saints of God, we are not promised that there won't be any tears along the way. Life's journey can be difficult at times, but we cannot lose heart, and we cannot let that stop us from doing the things that God is asking us to do. Perhaps it's just sharing a note or a phone call with someone, or maybe driving someone to a doctor's appointment. Maybe it's helping babysit a mother who needs some help there, or maybe even opening up our wallets just a little bit wider. Or maybe it's just giving a box of cereal and a few cans of tuna to those in need. The saints of God have lots and lots of work to do. And lastly, we can be assured that there will be a place for us with Father, with the Father for all eternity in heaven. There we will sit among this massive throne that's surrounded by a rainbow and singing angels. And there will be lots of other saints there from all over the world. And we will worship our Creator, and He will shelter us from all pain and suffering and difficulties. Amen.